Welcome back to lecture 23.2, where we're going to talk about equilibrium when the pressure is relevant. Okay, so last time we, we made the situation where we had a, a system, right? And a thermal reservoir. And we said, well, we can consider these to be our whole universe, right? Where we only need to make, we can make these rigid adiabatic walls. That is, they're exchanging neither mechanical nor thermal energy with any other surroundings. This is our system and our surroundings. We set our thermal reservoir to be some temperature T0. And in that last time, we said, um, these are not currently in equilibrium. We're going to allow heat to flow between them. But we had this wall fixed. Like you take a uh, pot of water and you uh, set it outside, for example, right? Or you, you, yeah, you put any two, a system in contact with another, and you ask what happens. When are these two in equilibrium? This time, instead, I want to make this a free wall, but also diathermal. So now it can exchange both mechanical and thermal energy. And so what's relevant is that the pressure no longer the volume. Okay? So this is going to have some temperature and pressure that we're going to care about. Okay, just like before, we can always invoke the second law. And here for the second law, we can now take as our whole world our system plus our reservoir. Okay? So that must always go uh, up, right? Because we're always going to be maximizing our entropy in any process, and the only time it's zero is when it's at equilibrium, or we're doing an isolated reversible process. Okay, so we're going to be maximizing our entropy. If we look at this term, right, delta S, of the reservoir is again simply minus Q over T0. Right? Because it's a constant temperature, all we need to know is the heat that flows out. And so we can say that delta S minus Q over T0 is greater than or equal to E0. Okay? So again, now we need to compare our first with our first law. And our first law was du equals dq plus dw. But now, because my, my volume can change, we need to say, OK, that delta u is going to be q uh, minus or du equals dq minus pdv, okay? All right, so here I'm going to, my, my reservoir is going to have a fixed pressure as well, right? And so for my, for this system, right, I'm really just doing the reservoir, because it has a fixed pressure, right? It's big. Then I can say that delta U 
is Q minus P0 delta V, right? I integrated this, this term, but this one was a constant, P0. Okay, so I should have taken this one and written T0 delta S minus Q is greater than or equal to 0. So what we're going to do is be able to take our Q from here. This is delta U plus P0 delta V and combine it with this one. So we get T0 delta S minus delta U minus P0 delta V is greater than or equal to be zero. Let's switch the sign. So we get delta u um, plus p0 delta v minus t0 delta s is less than or equal to be zero. So just like we did before, we can say, well, this is the same as, say, delta of PV, and this is the same as saying delta of TS, because those Ts are constant, and this is delta of, and that's the same as saying delta of, delta of U plus PV minus TS is less than zero. Great. So, what is U plus PV minus TS? We know this is G. Right? That is the Gibbs free energy. And so actually the Gibbs free energy then is really the relevant energy whenever we're thinking about temperature and pressure, right? Remember G was temperature and pressure. So this is really key. So many, 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 many uh, situations, temperature and pressure are irrelevant variables. Like boiling a pot of water, right? If you boil a pot of water at home, you're going to worry about the temperature, but also the, the pressure is what's fixed in the room, right? Not the volume. The volume's just allowed to, to, uh, to change randomly. <clears throat> or you'll say you do a chemical reaction, right? Often you're going to do a chemical reaction at atmospheric pressure. And so you're going to be worried about T and P. Okay, so what that means is uh, when temperature and pressure are the relevant variables, what the system wants to do is minimize, right, any spontaneous process, that means no added work, will minimize G, right? We're gonna, we're gonna actually, we'll, we'll let's say lower G, right? And equilibrium will uh, occur, is reached when dg equals zero. That is when g is a minimum. Excellent. So now we know that what the system wants to do is minimize the free energy. So let's look, for example, uh, we're going to use water uh, and ice a lot. All right, so imagine that I plot G versus T, right? How does the, the Gibbs free energy change with temperature. Okay, so what happens is that I get two curves. 
So this might be the curve for water, and this might be the curve for ice. Okay? So for some reason, whatever the internal process is, actually let's let's write G over M. The I need to, I just want to make it intrinsic at the moment. So imagine that I am in some system. So at any particular temperature, I need to ask, what state will my system be in? So if I have these Gibbs free energy intrinsic per as a function of temperature, I can tell you what it should be in. Because we know that we should always be in the lower G. Right? So at some temperature, I'll always be in the lower curve. So at high temperatures, you can see that we are going to be in the water state, right? But when we hit the phase transition, this is going to be the uh, melting. It's called the melting transition because we usually approach it from the bottom. The system will now follow the other curve, the lower energy curve, right? And so you can see that in fact, the because the system always needs to lower its internal en its its Gibbs free energy, this is what defines a phase transition, right? So the phase transition is going to be where those Gibbs free energies uh, curves cross over. All right, so I want to stop there and, and discuss a little bit more what happens at these phase transitions in terms of G. But let's break it up into one more section.